My name is Melanie Newton and I am an Associate Professor of History at the University of Toronto. I'm also the Director of the Caribbean Studies Program at the University of Toronto and um, I am originally from Barbados. So my current research is on histories of Indigenous people in the Caribbean focusing on a particular area of the Lesser Antilles. And the way that I got to that research was actually precisely because of the way that my students, when I started teaching at the University of Toronto in 2001, what I was noticing about, I noticed some very strange things about how they were using the word Indigenous. That they seemed very comfortable using the word Indigenous to talk about Afro-Caribbean people. They'd use Indigenous, they'd use, use Native. That, that seemed perfectly logical to them, which struck me as rather odd given where we lived, <laughs> that they didn't see that that might be problematic, right? So I started to think, well, you know, where are they getting this from? And I realized, oh, they're getting it from the textbooks that I give them to read. Because scholars of the Caribbean will also routinely use the word indigenous and native to talk about forms of culture, peoples, who are in fact of diasporic origin, um, particularly of, of enslaved diasporic origin. Um, so I really started to think about what's the origin of that. So that really launched me in terms of my current research. I think it is really important to get students to think about those things for two reasons. First of all, because what they are repeating is a colonial narrative of indigenous absence that facilitated both the dispossession of indigenous peoples in the Caribbean from their lands and then their invisibilization through the absence of treaties um, or through disrespect for the very few treaties, particularly in the area of the Caribbean that I research, there is not, in contrast to say the Great Lakes region where I now live, there is not a landscape of treaties. There are few, but they, are, they were ignored. And they were ignored precisely because treaty making and plantation expansion don't go well together historically. You don't tend to find many treaties where you have large plantations, right? Um, because planters didn't want to be um, constrained by treaties as they sought to expand their plantations and bring people in. So there's a re really close relationship between the expansion of plantation-based slavery and the absence of a treaty history that would then enable or force subsequent governments to at least acknowledge the presence of indigenous people. So, so there's that invisibilization of indigenous people that happens in the context of the expansion of slavery in the area of the Caribbean that I come from. At the same time, this language that the imperial government actually promoted of seeing enslaved Africans and then later, to some extent, indentured Asian workers as natives, quote unquote. You start to see that language really appearing in imperial documents in the 19th century. And what it contained, that term, was an assumption of servile status, non-citizenship. So you'd be subjects of the empire, but you were not citizens. Constraints on your movement, that you would only move when and where your labor was required. Um, racialization, criminalization. So all of those things are contained in that word native. And you start to see it being applied by imperial governments after emancipation. So what is replaced, what's, what is replaced, what slavery, what is, slavery is abolished in the 1830s, 1840s in the French and British Caribbean. And it's at that point that you start to see the increasing use of this term applied to those people, precisely in fact to reproduce the labor and social order of, sla of slavery without the legal apparatus of slavery. So what my students were picking up on with that term is precisely that kind of imperial effort to reproduce certain um, labor hierarchies and to make them seem natural. So for those reasons, I think it's incredibly important to get students who work in Caribbean history to not reproduce that language and to teach them to understand why it is that, you know, Subsequent you know, governments, intellectual elites, have not unpacked, in fact, that language. And to really see in that term and the misuse of these terms, indigenous and native, in the Caribbean context, the ways in which servile blackness are naturalized in the Caribbean and indigenous presence is made invisible. So historians do have to take, and I say historians, professional historians um, at universities, Teachers in schools also, the people who write exams, who set curriculum, um, CXC curriculum, the CAPE curriculum, um, there, there's an institutional responsibility. So the thing about institutionalized racism, people have a misunderstanding of what it is. Institutionalized racism is not about the color of 
the perpetrator. It's about the color of the victims, right? That is where you see what is at work. So the idea that, well, because, you know, the people who now are in charge of curricula across the Caribbean are themselves people of colonized heritage, that does not in any way excuse the kinds of narratives about indigenous people that are, that are perpetuated um, in school textbooks. And you have seen the sort of decolonization in some sense of the histories of slavery um, in particular um, and the struggles of people after slavery. You've really seen a major shift there. And I went to school here from the, in Barbados in the, I was born in 1974 and I went through the school system and I know that the Caribbean students who I get in Toronto now who have done history are learning something different about slavery. And some of them, if they have very progressive teachers, are learning different things about indigenous people. They're not doing what I did, you know, drawing pictures of Arawaks and Caribs and all that kind of nonsense and, you know, bohios and a little stool and all that. You know, they're not doing that kind of stuff anymore if they have a good progressive teacher. But that is, that is a fortunate. It's not systemic. So that responsibility to no longer be perpetrators of institutionalized racism against indigenous people is ours. And we have to take it on as a responsibility to insist and to do the labor of rewriting history textbooks, of removing those kinds of narratives from the textbooks. That is our job. That is what we are paid for. That is for those of us who went through the public education system here. That is what public education is supposed to do, to produce people who will be not citizens in some kind of passive sense, but active citizens who help to change what citizenship means and expand the meaning of that category through education. And to the extent that we have failed to do that, we have failed to do our job. So it is essential that we rewrite that narrative. We produce different textbooks. And it's not enough to just change the little section at the beginning where we talk about how all the indigenous people got killed. What a shame, you know? to integrate that fully into the curriculum so that indigenous people become part of the modern history curriculum of the Caribbean, you know, at every stage, at every stage. So, and it requires a complete rewriting, a complete rewriting. So I would say that, but I would even go further and say that that is the key for indigeneity, that is, the, that is required for the narrative about indigeneity. It is also required for the narrative about gender and sexuality. Um, in particular, I would say for me, those two questions of gender and sexuality and indigeneity, which are connected in colonial history, right? Um, that those two things are, it is essential that we as historians take up the responsibility of transforming those narratives in terms of what our students are learning and no longer reproduce normative categories that are racist against indigenous people or that affirm um, backwards understandings of gender, right? Um, you know, I was thinking, you know, there are many categories of gender in this world. The maleness, femaleness, fabulousness, you know, and we have to think, you know, of taking our histories into the realm of, you know, the fabulous, right? So that is what I would say. So I think this conference has been incredibly important. It is historic. It is a historic not just because of the women who have been here, the incredible indigenous women who have been here, but also that it now holds the educational institutions of um, the Anglophone Caribbean, the University of the West Indies, accountable in some sense to engage in a sustained conversation about its own role in now supporting this research, these struggles, um, and to see this, insofar as the university's role through education is to promote healthy and active forms of citizenship, that this conference now creates a context in which the university can be really held accountable. You know? I think for many of the women who come to this conference, I, I don't want to speak for indigenous women who came to this conference, but that opportunity to come and meet with each other and to share their struggles and to see the similarities and the differences, I mean, that is of incredible value because it, you know, when people return and you find yourself on your own struggling against the government, struggling against a mining company or a la land invasion, and the idea that you share this struggle 
with other people and when they have a victory, it's a victory for you, that they maybe have engaged in a strategy that is um, going to work for you. Those kinds of connections, they are so important, right? Because it is often precisely that kind of, um, you know, sort of international sort of solidarity and sense of people standing with you that enables people to find ways to, um, new and effective ways to, to fight, to fight back. We've also witnessed um, at the end of the keynote address yesterday by um, Christina Koch, a historic moment in terms of the sort of reconciliation between, and I'm using that term in a, in a really profound sense of, you know, mutual acknowledgement um, and standing together of the two indigenous groups of Belize, the Maya and the Garifuna, who have a really complicated history in relation to each other. Um, they share struggles as indigenous people, but have often been used against each other by the Belizean government, and before that, the colonial government of British Honduras, and set against each other in structural ways that are not um, in the interests of either community. And so that reconciliation was about a particular conversation about land that they're having and that they were finding quite difficult in the south of Belize. And these women stood together publicly and you know, declared for them that a desire to find community-based solutions to that you know, difference in opinion over that land, rather than going to say the Belizean courts or you know, like that, that was actually quite historic in terms of what it could mean in the future for indigenous people and processes of resolving, you know, these entanglements that colonial history has bequeathed us over the land and the seas that are our home. That for colonized people in this region and all across the Americas, our claims often overlap precisely because colonial governments have left us this sort of mess, messy legacy of competing claims that then can set us against each other and then we can never quite focus on where the real struggle is. So that was a model for, I think, Indigenous people in the Caribbean, Indigenous women's solidarity, but also for all of us in the Caribbean of the role of women and women's solidarity in the resolution of conflict. You know, speaking as a you know a Caribbean academic, um, you know a treaty person in Canada, um, prefer that rather than Canadian. Um, I think it is incredibly important that we take seriously the idea of training researchers who are Indigenous and who are from the Caribbean in all of the disciplines to research questions of Indigeneity in the Caribbean. Because historically what often happens, precisely because right now there's this incredible energy, and it's not to say that researchers who are not from this region do not matter, of course they do, right? And of course that's valuable. And a lot of that, I use archeologists' work and anthropologists' work and the work of literary scholars and so who are not from here, of course it's not, you know, the colonial histories are everyone's history, so you're all accountable, right? Um, but I think it's incredibly important that we see these as our stories and our um, responsibility to sort of decolonize and to shape new kinds of conversations and that we really take leadership in that process. Um, and that, you know, for say at least my generation of scholars and the students who I train, that we really take that up in a broad-based way. Um, because otherwise then these conversations end up happening in places that are not part of this geography, don't have that kind of intimate connection to it, whose lives are not at stake in the resolution of these questions. And it's the sense our lives are at stake in the resolution of these questions. And that urgency is incredibly important for the integrity of the research that is produced.